you will, you can pass the cups to the aisle and the brothers will come by and grab those for you. Thank you, brothers. I just want to continue uh, encouraging you to spend the time, you know, each month before that the Lord's Supper comes up in just reflecting on those things and what uh, an importance they play in a healthy biblical church and how important they are to us. Uh, many of you, I know I have, we've come out of churches where um, there's no real significance to any of those things, and the Christian life was, was so-called um, basically just superficial, you know, Sunday to Sunday, just go to church, go home, uh, you've got your life that you live during the week, and then you show up on Sunday, and you're a Christian for a couple hours, and uh, just meaningless, but the Lord has called us to much more than that, and so the supper has great significance uh, for the Christian and for his church. All right. All right, our sermon title this morning is A Heart for Confrontation, A Heart for Confrontation, and our passage is in 1 Timothy uh, chapter 5, verses 1 and 2 we'll begin looking at today. A Heart for Confrontation from 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, and here Paul says to Timothy, beginning in verse 1, do not rebuke an older man, but exhort him as a father, younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, younger women as sisters with all purity. And it's interesting to think about that title for a moment, a heart for confrontation. Uh, usually when you think of confrontation, you don't think of a heart for it. Uh, you think of avoiding it uh, or something that's negative. The Bible is very clear that there is a time and a place for confrontation. And we need to understand not only what that time and place is, we got to have the right heart about it. There's a specific way in which we're to do that. We are to confront our brothers and sisters when there's a need to confront them, and there are often needs in the body for that. We'll begin looking at that example and that command today. Now, the purpose of Paul's writing to Timothy, as we've been working through this letter to Timothy, there was a main purpose for the letter that we came across, and that's where Paul says to Timothy that he's writing so that we should know how we are to conduct ourselves in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Ultimately, that's the purpose for the letter. We need to know how we're to conduct ourselves. Now, as Paul has been instructing Timothy, he spent the last couple of paragraphs that we've gone through on Timothy's own personal life, Timothy's own personal character, and Timothy's own ministry, the way that his ministry is to look. And remember, that flows down to us by way of application for the personal ministry that we're to have, the personal life as a Christian that we're to live. And so he moves on now from Timothy's personal life and Timothy's personal ministry to now how do we inter interrelate in a very practical way with other people in the church? How do we do it? And in this, we're going to see several different aspects, several different categories. As we get into the verse 1 and 2 here, beginning chapter 5, we're going to look broadly at various ages and genders. How do you interla interrelate to or relate to Older men, older women, younger men, younger women. How are we to do that? Then he moves on in verses 3 to 16 with how we're to relate to widows. That's going to have important application for us as well. Then he's going to address how we relate to elders in verses 17 to 25. Slaves in chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. And then false teachers and their followers in chapter 6, verses 3 through 10. Now, the instruction that he gives here, beginning in verses 1 and 2, are necessary for the pastor. Pastor's got to understand how to do this. Here, Pastor Timothy, a very difficult assignment in Ephesus, needs to know how he's going to relate to people in his church. And there are tough situations he has to address. But if we want to be a church that is healthy, that is biblical, that is thriving, that is pure, that is fervent and zealously following the Lord Jesus Christ, we ourselves have to know how to do this. And this is something that we must do. We all have to learn how to handle confrontation, and it needs to be done with the right heart. We have to learn how to invest in one another's lives. And listen, this is largely abandoned in the professing church today, but it's something the Lord commands us to do, and we need to be serious about doing this if we want a church to be blessed by God. We need to have a right heart for confrontation. We must be willing to invest in each other's lives. Anonymity which is so popular in the church today, anonymity will kill your spiritual life and will kill the church. If most people with a consumer mindset, they want to slip in a little bit late and avoid everybody and then slip out a little early so they avoid everybody. 
They don't want anybody knowing their business, and so they're just anonymous in the church. It's like going to a movie theater where you don't know anyone else. You get a good show, maybe eat some popcorn, and then you go home. And that's what has degenerated into the modern church today. No man, no woman in the Lord's church is to be an island. We were saved into a community. We're saved into a a brotherhood, a sisterhood, if you will. And we're to be together in this work of seeing that the body is matured, seeing that Christians are grown up into the stature, the fullness of Christ. And I mean this in the best possible way, but in light of that, listen, we've got to be in each other's business. That's what the Lord would command. That's what Scripture teaches. We're not to be anonymous. We're not to be islands. We're not to be lone rangers. Um, We are saved into a community, right? There's points that we're going to explore from these first two verses, all right? If we want the right heart for confrontation, Number one, we need to have a heart for obedience to the Lord's commands. Right heart for obedience. Secondly, we need to have a heart for wisdom. We need to understand that these things need to be done in wisdom. We need to get wisdom from the Lord with how to do that. We need to take that to heart and do these things correctly. And then thirdly, we're to have a heart for our family. And the Lord uses family terms throughout this paragraph. And we'll look at those, okay? So the first point here is we need to have a heart for obedience, a heart for obedience. We get that from verse 1, where Paul says to Timothy, do not rebuke an older man, do not rebuke him, but exhort him, and exhort him as a follower, as a father, okay? So we have two commands represented by two verbs in this first verse. You have do not rebuke, that's a command, and then you have exhort, and that's a command. If we're to have a right heart for confronting sin in the body of Christ, We need to have a heart to obey the Lord in these two commands. That's not, it's easier said than done. Because exhorting someone or confronting someone in sin, it's a really easy thing to do, right? No, it's not an easy thing to do. It's a very hard thing to do. You've got to go to someone and you've got to talk to them about their sin. Not easy to do, but this is a command. This is a command. This is not a suggestion. It's a command from the Lord. And if we want a healthy thriving, holy living, fervent, zealous, obedient church is something we've got to come to grips with. We need a heart here to obey. These commands, do not rebuke, and then the command to exhort, come in the context here of confronting an older man in his sin. How easy is that? Not easy at all in the beginning. This is something we have to learn how to do. And it also, it necessitates that we have a right heart in doing it, And it necessitates a heart that's like, all right, Lord, you've commanded that I do it. And so as difficult as it may be, I'm committing myself to your word. I'm commending myself to what you are having me do here, and I'm going to obey. I'm going to do this. At first blush now, as we look at this, do not rebuke, but exhort. Sounds a little like a contradiction because there are other passages. If you know your Bible, there are other passages in Scripture which specifically say that we are to rebuke. Um, Speaking of elders... Uh, right here in 1 Timothy in chapter 5, verse 20, Paul says this. He says, those who are sinning, rebuke them. Rebuke them in the presence of all that the rest also may fear. Of the elder's task in Titus chapter 1, verse 13, Paul says, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. He says, this testimony is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. And Paul tells Timothy later in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2, He says, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and teaching. All right, so we've got several passages, and there are others, commanding us to rebuke. But here in chapter 5, verse 1, he says, don't rebuke. So where's the the difficulty here? Where's the, the rub? Paul says there's a different circumstance in mind here. He has a different context in mind. And the reason there's a different context is because he uses a different word. Now, it's not obvious in the English but it's there in the Greek. Here in chapter 5, verse 1, Paul uses a word that he only uses here. He uses it nowhere else. And for you Greek guys, it's called the hapax legomenon. Hapax legomenon. It only appears once in the New Testament. It doesn't appear anywhere else, okay? And this is, this word is epi, meaning upon, and plexes, meaning to strike. Epi plexes. The word being used here is different from those other examples of rebuke, rebuke in Scripture, in that it means to strike or to inflict a blow. It's speaking here of a verbal assault. It carries a sense of violence and violence with your tongue. 
So what Paul is saying to Timothy is, listen, don't verbally assault an older man, but exhort him as a father. Don't tongue lash someone older than you. You're to be respectful, and you're to treat them with respect. You're to exhort them as a father. And so that's where this differs. It is metaphorically used for someone who is beating up someone else, verbally abusing someone with their speech. Now, maybe you've been in a church where that's happened to you. I was speaking with a guy earlier this week that happened to him. In a church where the leadership of the church verbally, the leader, verbally abusive, um, raked them over the coals. How many of you have known someone, maybe you yourself, have been in a relationship before that has been verbally abusive? You have to go home to verbal abuse every day. Every day you come home, you get a tongue lashing. Here, Paul is telling Timothy to be careful that this doesn't happen in the church. We're not to verbally abuse one another. We're not to verbally, violently assault one another with our words. In this sense, don't rebuke them in that way, okay? It's interesting that this word, when we look at chapter 3, and the character of an elder. In, ch- in verse 3, it uses a very similar word when it says that an elder is not to be given to violence. That word for violence is a similar word. We're not to be violent with our speech toward one another. Are there times in the church where you need to rebuke? Yes. But does that mean that you're going to verbally assault them? Absolutely not. Does it mean here that when it says, do not rebuke an older man, do not verbally assault an older man? Well, does that mean that it's okay to verbally assault an older woman? No. It means you can verbally assault your mother-in-law. No. No verbal assaults. It's not a verbal assault to an older man. It's not a verbal assault to an older woman. It's not a verbal assault to a younger man or a younger woman either. It carries through the whole phrase. We're not to, we're not to beat each other up with how we talk to one another. We're to be patient. We're to be loving. We're to be kind. We're to be gentle, the Bible says. Here, you don't tongue lash people in the church. Older man there. The same word used for elder, where we get the office of elder, but here it just means someone older than you, all right? Someone older than you. We're not to verbally assault a sinning older man, okay? Now, the command carries through the entire phrase, the entire sentence. You don't rebuke anyone that way, but you exhort younger men, younger sisters, and older women you exhort them. So the first command that we're looking at here from verse one is basically this. Don't abuse your leadership. Don't abuse that brother for whom Christ died. You don't verbally assault them. You're not to be verbally abusive. Additionally, it also carries here the sense of disrespect. You're not to be disrespectful. When it says don't rebuke an older man, but exhort him as a father, the manner in which that you're to talk to an older man is to be respectful. How would you speak to your father? How should you speak to your father? You speak to your father with respect. Honor your father and your mother, right? You're to treat them with respect. So it carries here also the sense of don't disrespect them. This comes on the heels of Paul's exhortation to Timothy not to let anyone look down on his youth. In the same way that Timothy is not to allow these elders to look down on him because of his youth, he's not to look down on them with his authority. He's to be loving in this, all right? to show respect, to show deference. Take care with how you speak to people, with how you correct them, how you confront them. Cannot be abusive. All right. You can, with your words, cause to stumble that one for whom Christ died. If you verbally lash out or assault someone verbally in correcting or rebuking or uh, exhorting, you can cause them to stumble. You can get in the way of Christ. You can get in the way of the Holy Spirit and the work in that person by having them focus on your attack versus having them focus on the true solution to their problem, which is going to be the work of the Holy Spirit. Abusive authoritarianism is often accompanied by or uses to get results fear. Not fear in the person, but fear as a weapon. Fear is a tool to gain a response authoritarianism used as a way to get a response out of you. It's often accompanied by pride in the person who's doing it. It's done because they are insecure or because they are defensive or because they feel as though they need to be in control. It is a patent lack of trust in the Holy Spirit who is the one who will get the results. doesn't matter ultimately. doesn't matter what you say, how you say it, 
what you do or how you're going to do it, you don't get the results. The Lord uses you as a means to accomplish His ends, and He gets the results, and He gets the glory. So if you come to a situation where you're going to confront someone, and you think that you're going to manufacture results by being heavy-handed, you're thinking unbiblically, you're in sin. You're not to confront someone that way. It's the guy that comes in his pride and says, do it because I said so. And if you don't do it, my wrath is going to be on you. That's not the way that we're to treat one another in the church. It produces this manner of doing things, this abusive authoritarianism produces fake superficial results um, based on intimidation, based on a fear of man. It's not based on a fear of the Lord and a desire to please the Lord out of a loving heart. It has nothing to do with that. And as a result, it produces cold, dead, heartless religion. It will produce joyless and hopeless so-called Christians. It will produce dead orthodoxy. It's gonna, it doesn't give way to the Spirit of God, and so it's not going to produce holiness. The Bible says, James 1, verse 19 and 20, So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. For the wrath of man, expressed often in this abusive authoritarianism, does not produce the righteousness of God. And in your heavy-handed, authoritarian, abusive, verbal tongue lashing of another person, you can actually get in the way of the Holy Spirit um, and in your pride wreck the life of that person that you're trying to help, so you say. Um, we can't, in our anger and pride, produce the righteousness of God. The Lord will use the means of your loving correction, your loving rebuke, your loving entreaty, your loving appeal. He will use your loving appeal to produce the right results, and He gets the glory for that. You have the potential, if you think about it this way, in your verbally abusive assault against someone else, creating not a convert of Christ, but creating an entirely different convert altogether, a convert of Satan. And you may do that for good if you're not careful, um, turning them away from Christ. This is a foolish and sinful approach to leadership. It's a foolish and sinful approach to dealing with people. We've got to learn from it. Uh, this is often fueled by pride. There's many examples of this in Scripture, all right? Many examples, but I want us to look at one. Turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 12. 1 Kings chapter 12. Here's an example of someone in his pride trying to control the situation not giving heed to the Spirit of God in that, but trying to control things himself uh, in an effort to be manipulative, in an effort to get superficial results, gives way to his pride, gives way to this abusive authoritarianism, and he just makes a mess of things. First Kings chapter 12, beginning in verse 1, this is a story of Rehoboam. Rehoboam. Rehoboam comes on the scene after Solomon, and he makes some really foolish decisions with respect to leadership. And we need to learn from this. In 1 Kings chapter 12, look at verse 1. It says here that Rehoboam went to Shechem, for all Israel had gone to Shechem to make him king. And so it happened when Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, heard it, he was still in Egypt, for he had fled from the presence of King Solomon and had been dwelling in Egypt, that they sent and called him. Then Jeroboam and the whole assembly of Israel came and spoke to Rehoboam, saying, Your father made our yoke heavy. Now, therefore, lighten the burdensome service of your father and his heavy yoke, which he put on us, and we will serve you. So Solomon had a heavy yoke, taxes on the people. So they're coming to Rehoboam, who's now becoming king. They're saying to Rehoboam, listen, can you lighten the load? If you lighten the load, we're going to serve you. Uh, you're going to gain the favor, the love, the loyalty of your people. If you'll just lighten the taxes a little bit. Give us a little bit of a break here. Um, these were elders making this request, very likely those that were of the same age as Solomon, who was Rehoboam's father, and had served Solomon when Solomon was king, right? So they're making a reasonable request here, and the request is wise. Had Rehoboam followed their wisdom and had complied with their request, there would have been peace in Israel. But what does Rehoboam do? Let's read on. Verse 5, so he said to them, depart from me for three days and then come back to me. And the people departed. 
Then King Rehoboam consulted the elders who stood before his father Solomon while he still lived and said, How do you advise me to answer these people? So they spoke to him saying, If you will be a servant to these people today and will serve them and answer them and speak good words to them, then they will be your servants forever. Yeah, you win more flies with honey, right? You know what it is? You speak to them kindly, respectfully, lovingly, with their best interest at heart, and you win loyalty forever. This is the same instruction to Timothy. Don't speak to them in a verbally abusive way. You exhort them as a father with respect, with love, with care, with concern, not with a verbal tongue lashing, okay? Now think about it for a moment. Rehoboam is about 41 years old when this happens. So he's not a, a young man who's just completely foolish. He's 41 years old. But these men that he's talking to are older than he is. And Rehoboam didn't make a, a rash decision here. He took three days to consider what he was about to do. Foolish. Look what, he's, look what he does. Verse 8. But he rejected the advice which the elders had given him and consulted the young men who had grown up with him, his peers, who stood before him. And he said to them, what advice do you give? How should we answer this people who have spoken to me, saying, lighten the yoke which your father put on us? Then the young men who had grown up with him spoke to him, saying, well, this seems typical of a lot of young men who often fall victim and pray to pride. Thus you should speak to this people who have spoken to you, saying, your father made our yoke heavy, but you make it lighter on us. Thus you shall say to them, my little finger shall be thicker than my father's waist. In other words, you thought the taxes were heavy before? You're going to see my power in my severity, and Rehoboam here is going to fuel his pride. Verse 11, and now, whereas my father put a heavy yoke on you, I will add to your yoke. My father chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scourges. You want to make a scourge? You take a whip and you add pieces of metal and bone to it. It was a wicked whip is what it was. This is Rehoboam in his pride, in his authoritarian, abusive leadership. And now, if he had gone the other direction, there would have been peace. But in, a, in, a, in an effort to control or in an effort to fuel his pride, in an effort to manipulate, to get his own way, or whatever the case may be here, he takes this authoritative and abusive stance. Look at verse 12. So Jeroboam, all the people, came to Rehoboam the third day, as the king had directed, saying, come back to me the third day. Verse 13. Then the king answered the people roughly. It's like, why? why? Why the necessity to answer them roughly? Again, this is just more pride, more control, more exercising of your own authority. It's wickedly unbiblical. It's sinful. We're not to answer roughly. We're to exhort the older man as a father, the older woman as a mother. Um, this is just another example of this. He answered them roughly, and he rejected the advice which the elders had given him. Verse 14, and he spoke to them according to the advice of the young men, saying, My father made your yoke heavy, but I'll add to your yoke. My father chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scourges. And so the king did not listen to the people. That's interesting here, this, this turn of phrase here at the end of this clause. Listen to this. He didn't listen to the people, for the turn of events was from the Lord that he might fulfill his word. Now, God is not the author of evil, but God uses even evil, even the sins of Rehoboam here to accomplish his ends. The Lord had said that he was going to judge Israel. He was going to judge Judah. And here he uses the wickedness of Rehoboam to do just that. So this is, again, it's an example of abusive authoritarianism. And we're not to respond to people that way. And we're to be careful with how we interact with one another. Now, there's a lot that can go wrong here, right? You set out as a, maybe a young Christian, and you want to be faithful to the Lord. You want to obey the Lord's commands. And you say, you know what? I got to get serious about doing this. I need to be faithful to the Lord in this. And the Lord lays an opportunity before you. Someone you know, maybe a brother or sister that you're close to, and they're in sin, what is your responsibility to them? The Scripture clearly says multiple places that you are to exhort them. You're to be faithful to the Lord here. And so maybe this fear of doing things wrong or this fear of, well, how do I speak to them? How am I to do this without sinning, without causing them to sin? Does that give you an excuse to shrink back and not do it at all? No, you got to plunge in. It's how the Lord will grow you, how the Lord will mature you in doing this very thing. And in doing this very thing, He grows and matures and purifies and sanctifies the church. 
is something that is necessary to do. We are to exhort one another, older men, older women, younger men, younger women. They're not to be verbally assaulted, but they are to be ministered to. So there's a second command here. We're not to rebuke, that's the first command, but we are to exhort, that's the second command. It's split by a very strong contrasting word for but, Allah in the Greek. It's um, a very strong contrast. Not to do the one at all, but make sure that you're doing this over here. We're to exhort, all right? And although there is a wrong way to do this that we must avoid, we must confront sin in the body of Christ. And there's a necessity for this that backs up this command. There's a necessity for the purity of the church, for the sanctity of the church, for the testimony of the church to the world. How effective is the testimony of a church, a sinning church, to the world? I'm not going down there. The church bunch full of hypocrites, right? Or every time a pastor falls into immorality, or when you've got wicked hypocrites that attend that church and people know, like when that guy goes to that church, I'm never going to go to that church. I've seen the way that guy lives. It's a wicked, terrible testimony. So for the holiness and for the testimony of Christ's church, we must do this. There's also another necessity that backs up that command, and it's this necessity for us to love and care for our brothers and sisters. Let me give you an example of this. Turn to Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. If you love your brother, if you love your sister, then you care about where they will spend eternity. You care about how closely and how fervently and how faithfully they follow the Lord. You care if they begin to withdraw themselves or if they begin to fall away. Uh, it's like caring for your own son or your own daughter. I care about what happens with my daughters. I'm concerned about what happens with my wife. We're to be concerned for one another in the church. Here in Hebrews chapter 2, let's begin to set this up. We have a responsibility because souls hang in the balance. There must be accountability in the church, and you are your brother's keeper. We see that here established in the letter to the Hebrews. Look at chapter 2, and look beginning at verse 1. He says here, Therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. For if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? In other words, we need to give heed to what we hear so that we can persevere to the end and be saved, not neglecting this salvation that the Lord has provided. Flip the page, and we see the outworking of that in chapter 3, beginning in verse 12. Chapter 3, beginning in verse 12. We're here, the Bible says, Beware, brethren, lest there be in you. And that'd be one thing if it said that, but it's any of you. <laughs> He's not just speaking to you personally. We have responsibility for any of us. Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. That word there for exhort is our same word that we're looking at in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 1. We're to exhort, all right? And we're to exhort daily, and we must do this. This is another command. It says in verse 14, for, right, for this reason, we have become partakers of Christ if, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. And so what is the reason? What's the necessity that backs up the command that we are to exhort one another? The very real possibility that there are those who will fall away from the faith. We saw it in 1 Timothy when Paul charged Timothy, there were some teaching divergent doctrines, making shipwreck of people's faith. And so Timothy was charged with going in and stopping that nonsense because people were falling away. They were apostatizing. And so we looked at that passage on apostasy. Here, this same warning holds true. We must, as Christians, persevere to the end to be saved. Now, aside from the vast majority of what gets taught in modern evangelicalism today, that you can profess Christ with your lips, and then if you depart the Lord three years from now and you're still a Christian, it's not what the Bible teaches. If you fall away from Christ, it means you were never saved to begin with. I heard this story, and I know you know exactly what I'm talking about. There's a book called Eternal Security where um, it said that becoming a Christian and making a profession of faith is a lot like getting a tattoo. 
If you walk into the tattoo parlor, get your tattoo, walk out the doors and say, you know what, that's the stupidest thing I've ever done. Doesn't matter, you got the tattoo. It's done, right? His analogy was, you walk into a church, you profess Christ, and you walk out thinking, that's the stupidest thing I've ever done. I'm going to be an atheist. Too bad. You made the profession. Now you're a Christian forever. You can never be lost. Is that what the Bible teaches? No. That is a lie straight from the pit of hell, and it will damn you if you hold on to that belief that you can just go off and live in your sin apart from Christ. Here, it is if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. So it is then incumbent upon us, life and death, eternity and heaven or hell hang in the balance and it is necessary that we persevere to the end, holding our confidence in Christ. This letter was written because the Hebrews here in the dispersion were considering going back, going back to Judaism under great persecution. We can't go back. We are not of those who shrink back to perdition. We are those that press forward to the saving of the soul. And we are responsible to one another in that. You are your brother's keeper. So when you notice someone who is trailing off or withdrawing themselves or pulling back from faith in Christ. It's necessary. We've got to go after them. We've got to exhort them. There's a manner in which we do it that's important, but it must be done. Go on to verse chapter 4. Look at chapter 4, verse 1. Chapter 4 says, Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear, lest any of you seem to have come short of it. We need to fear for our brothers and sisters. Don't come short. And when someone begins to trail you go to them and you exhort them saying, listen, brother, I'm concerned for you. Don't fall short. Hang in there. Many of you may have been in a position before in your own Christian experience where you felt like throwing in the towel. Listen, throwing in the towel is no choice at all. There is no choice. You follow Christ. You throw in the towel, you're going to hell. We have to, we have to get involved in each other's lives. If you've been here for any length of time, You've seen those that have begun to withdraw, right? That have begun to turn back to their sin. Um, they're not holding their confidence firm to the end. And maybe you've gone to them too late. Uh, and there are many who are not here. And that should grieve us. As soon as it seems that someone is departing the faith, you go and you wrap your arms around them. As Spurgeon says, you grab around their knees, let them go to hell over your dead body. But we're to exhort one another, we're to care for one another, we're to make sure this doesn't happen. It's necessary in the body of Christ to do this work. And you have to have a heart that wants to obey the Lord in this because people's souls hang in the balance. We've got to be faithful. Look at verse 11, chapter 4, verse 11. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. We don't want anyone to fall. Flip the page to chapter 6. Chapter 6. And look down at verse 9. Chapter 6, verse 9. Here he says, But beloved, we're confident of better things concerning you. Yes, things that accompany salvation, though we speak in this manner. For God is not unjust to forget your work and your labor of love, which you have shown toward his name, in that you have ministered to the saints. Our labor in the Lord is not in vain. And the Lord remembers your labor of love, your labor in exhorting, your labor for the saints to see them strengthened. He remembers that, and that is shown toward His name in that we minister to the saints and do minister, it says there. Uh, look over another page, chapter 10. Chapter 10. Look down at verse 23. Chapter 10, verse 23, it says, Let us hold fast. The confession of our hope without wavering. This is called the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints. It is not enough to say the doctrine of eternal security. Eternal security is a portion of the perseverance of the saints. The doctrine that encompasses all of this is the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints. We're to hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in this. To stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. It is a, it's incumbent upon us to do this. Look at Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. 
And this more is exhortation. This is our responsibility to the body of Christ. Verse 12 says this, Therefore, strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be dislocated but rather be healed. Pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Looking carefully. That's what we're talking about here. Looking carefully, watching out for one another, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. We're to look out for one another. We're to watch carefully. This was a reality for Timothy in Ephesus. Uh, Ephesus was a difficult assignment, and Timothy was going to have to confront those in sin. It was tough. Um, In chapter 1, verse 3, back in 1 Timothy, Timothy was commanded to approach older men, elders in the church, and charge them to stop teaching divergent doctrines, stop teaching false teaching. Um, So how do you then censure an older man without communicating disrespect or without communicating a, uh, an abusive authoritarianism, if you're in Timothy's shoes or in our shoes. How do you do that? Well, you do what verse 1 goes on to say. You exhort them. You parakaleo. It means to call along to your side. It has a semantic range, meaning any, anything from comfort to encouragement to correction to reproof. It has a wide semantic range, all right? And you are to urge them. You're to correct them. You're to appeal to them. You're to call them to your side, all right? Again, this parakaleo here in verse 1 is a present tense active verb, which means that it's ongoing, it's consistent, it's a way of life. Uh, Galatians 6, verse 1 says this, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. The right heart from for confronting sin then is not a violent verbal attack, but the right heart for confronting sin is a loving, restorative, redemptive, patient, gentle, forgiving, strengthening, corrective, respectful confrontation. That's the way we're to do it. It's exhort, it's parakaleo, calling them to your side. Now put yourself in Timothy's shoes. This is something we all have a responsibility to do. Timothy is reasonably young, and he's been somewhat faint-hearted. Now, imagine you in the situation of having to address an older man in his sin. Would that make you might be, you think you might be faint-hearted in that situation? It's not easy to do. It's a learned skill, something we have to be ready to do so that we learn how to do it. He's been commanded to set an example. He's been commanded to make sure that his progress is evident to all. Uh, His leadership to this point could be characterized possibly as timid. Um, There was conflict raging in the church at Ephesus. Things were becoming unraveled. Ephesus was coming apart at the seams. And Timothy was going to have to step in, deal with false teachers. There were women who were devotees of the false teachers who were being led away by various lusts. He was going to have to deal with that. He was going to have to say some hard things and do some hard things. And rebuke and correction were absolutely going to be necessary. But he could not give in to his timidity or his fear in this. You, Christian, cannot give into a spirit of fear or timidity in this. You must do it. And re- very quickly, let me give you one example. Go to Ezekiel chapter 2. Ezekiel chapter 2 with me. And let's take some exhortation here from the Lord himself uh, on this. That we must do this and be thankful in this, to this point, that you don't have the assignment that Timothy had in Ephesus, and you don't have the assignment that Ezekiel here had in Israel. And then take exhortation from the Lord on what to do about it here, beginning chapter 2, verse 1. So God said here, he said to me, to Ezekiel, son of man, stand on your feet and I'll speak to you. Then the spirit entered me when he spoke to me and he set me on my feet and I heard him who spoke to me. And he said to me, Son of man, I am sending you to the children of Israel. How, do you like, how would you like this, this assignment, right? To a rebellious nation that has rebelled against me. 
They and their fathers have transgressed against me to this very day, for they are impudent and stubborn children. And I am sending you to them, and you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord God, As for them, whether they hear or whether they refuse, for they are a rebellious house, yet they will know that a prophet has been among them. Listen, whether they hear you or they... If Matthew 18, if they hear you, you've won your brother. Praise the Lord. But whether they hear you or not, whether they're going to listen to you or not, you have a job to do. You must exhort. Verse 6, you, son of man, do not be afraid of them, and don't be afraid of their words. Though briars and thorns are with you, and you dwell among scorpions, do not be afraid of their words or dismayed by their looks, though they are a rebellious house. But you shall speak my words to them, whether they hear you or whether they refuse, for they are rebellious. But you, son of man, hear what I say to you. Do not be rebellious like that rebellious house. Open your mouth and eat what I give you. In other words, speak my words. Listen, they may be rebellious or they may not be. They may receive your words or they may not. You're not to fear them. You're to do the work that God has given you to do, whether they receive it or not. And you're not to be rebellious as they are. You're to do what the Lord has asked you to do. Um, This is a job that we've got. And we have to do this faithfully and well because this is so important to the soul of that person and so important to the health and vitality of the Lord's church. James 5, 19. This is why it's so important. James says this, Brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. In this, lives are at stake. A church is serious business. This is not a a weekend deal. The church is made up of people who have never dying souls. And we need to care for one another in this. If you're here today and you're a Christian, I'm pleading with you. I am pleading with you on the authority from God's word and for our own benefit, for the benefit of Christ's church, which he purchased with his own blood. Be faithful to the Lord in exhorting your brother If you see people trailing off, go after them. If you see people sinning, get that corrected. If you yourself are sinning, receive exhortation with humility. It's for the good of this church, for the good of the body, for the good of that person's soul, for your own good, and for the good of God's name. If you're here today and you're not a Christian, what in the world are you doing There is judgment that hangs over your head. We come to you now and exhort and plead with you, be reconciled to God, or you will face an eternal torment, an eternal judgment against your sin. Aren't you sick and tired of the life that you're living? Turn to Christ. And listen, when Christ forgives you of your sin, washes you clean, He adopts you into His body, and He puts you in a family of people that care for and love and tend to your soul. You're not alone in this. The Lord will wash you and cleanse you and care for you, says in Ezekiel, like a baby, (laughs) for your eternal good. If you persist in your sin, living life for yourself, you will die and face the judgment and fury of Almighty God. Be reconciled. Be justified. Turn from your sin and put your faith in Christ. Um, People, my brothers and sisters, I love you. And I love this church. Uh, We've got to be faithful to the Lord in this. Don't give up on going to your brother, going to your sister. Don't be slack in approaching and exhorting and loving and holding accountable. We have to have accountability. And that is, the Lord has blessed that here. Amen? If you've been here, you've seen beautiful fruit come from brother, loving brother, and just going and addressing sin. Don't stop. Don't give up on that work. And in that, there's great blessing, great faithfulness to the Lord, and the Lord will continue to give us fruit. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, God, we love you. Lord, we thank you so much for this instruction. It's so practical, and God, thank you for that. Uh, thank you for the, the fruit that we've seen as a result of that in this church. And God, I pray that we just continue to be faithful in these things. Um, I love my brothers and sisters, and I care about what happens to them, and I know they care about what happens to me, and we are our brother's keeper, and we see that clearly from your word. 
Help us to be faithful in these things, to honor you, Lord, but also for the good of their soul. So help us as we apply these truths. I pray that we'd be convicted by this, God. I pray that we'd be shamed, Lord, when we don't faithfully obey you in this, but that, Lord, you would continue to bless, that you continue to bear fruit as a result of the faithfulness of your people in this, and that you would be honored, that Christ would be exalted, and that when we get to heaven, we'd be there together. And we love you, Lord, and thank you for this time of worship. I pray that you'd be pleased with it in Jesus' name. Amen.